Good evening or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to another BR313 Symposium. This is a talk interview show where it's like the old Greek symposiums in ancient Athens or maybe what you have the Druids around the circle, where not only do we interview a guest that we find interesting, it's people we ask that we find personally interesting and their work, but also we have a little banter and a talk and we share ideas and information. The basic concept is that we actually are all learning from this and new ideas can grow from this, not only for us, but hopefully for our guests as well. Now today I have a remarkable man called Ramsey Jukes. He's also known as Lionel Snell, but for the, for the sake of this, I will interview, I'll prefer him as Ramsey because that's how I know him. Ramsey is from England. He was born in the mid-1940s, I believe. And whilst reading Pure Mathematics at Cambridge, he developed an interest in the work of Austin Osmond Spare, and, uh, which we all, we all admire greatly on this program, and started writing essays about this. Eventually just led to a, a writings and actual practice of magic and a book called Essays and Magic and on some other writing that brought him into close contact with the emerging chaos magic movement of the 1970s in which he became an instrumental figure. Now, among all of this, he's had the remarkable experience of taking the Abermellon operation to completion. And this is going to be a fascinating talk. So, Ramsey, welcome to the symposium. And we're delighted to have you here. Hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, it's, I'm looking forward to this. Now, the first question is regarding a magical operation. Mm -hmm. Which is more important, the journey or the destination? Well, I'm very much a, a journey person. Um, and, uh, you know, destinations, I sometimes feel rather sorry for people who found the truth, you know, because they don't usually end up very happy with it. Um, whereas exploring is, is very much what I enjoy. Yeah. Hmm. When you look back on the on say something like the Abermellon ritual, mm. and I, I remember reading once or hearing once that you said you didn't get the the, the grand spectacular mm. at the end, but over a number of years later, there was these resolutions that happened in your life that made you realize mm. that you did get what you want when I guess the universe was ready. I, I've often mm. believed that's a very important aspect of all kinds of spiritual, not just magical operations. Mm. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about a little bit about that? Yes, I, I mean, uh, I can sound a little glib, but I sort of think that uh, magic tends to give you what you need, um, and uh, sometimes <laughs> that can be quite a sort of a wrap. Um, uh, there was a, a lovely example. Do you ever watch weird, uh, listen to weird studies? That excellent podcast. Yeah, yeah, because in that I remember. Um, uh, one of them was saying years ago he did a magical operation to make a large sum of money you know he didn't want to sort of just a small check or something a large sum and the very next day a surprise check arrived and it was for a miserable something like 63 dollars or something but what hit him when he looked at it was you know how those old um uh checks used to look pay name of bearer um the sum of in big letters and then you write down the, the sum is so he saw the sum in big letters and he thought oh shit yeah. um now the thing is that if he had got a thousand pounds this was years ago he would have probably spent it by now and it wouldn't have changed his life much whereas that taught him something about magic which many years later he brought up in a conversation, you know, an intelligent conversation about it, and um, was still getting value from it. Uh, yeah. What it taught him about magic. So <laughs> that's the sort of thing that happens all too often in magic. You know, you get something which uh, seems like a disappointment, but if you accept it magically, what does this answer actually do to me? Very often, it's much more interesting than what you originally were looking for. There's a poetic unfoldment there that's a very beautiful thing, I find, even in this tragic, even in a kind of tragic or dark consequences. It's just like mm. you said, it's giving you what you need. It's almost mm. like a corrective force in your own dharma or something. I find that mm. much in the county, even reading like the life of like William Butler Yeats and similar, his own things with the Golden Dawn. He was basically involved with Maud Gone to the point where that's all he wanted. In the end, he didn't get her, but she said something very beautiful for all his magic, for all his and for all his disappointment and not winning me over. 
he mm. produced all this incredible poetry and became an you know won won a, won a Nobel pro- yes. prize. So there you go. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it was the rejection of Maud Gone and the need for her mm. that that made him a great poet. Yes, interesting. I think sometimes I, I think of the sort of reductionist materialist worldview has the effect of like crystallizing and freezing the world into certain fixed states. And a bit of magic that melts it slightly and a bit of flow can take place. You know, it's like, and um, yeah, it, it can it can hurt when it first it cracks and then begins to move. But very often, you know, it's, it's progress. It's taking you somewhere. I'm interested in the whole thing of you become studying when you're reading mathematics at Cambridge. How did mm. you correlate the two world, like the left and right brain, to use that cliche? How did you yes. correlate those two fields? Mm. Well, you see, the interesting thing is that um, uh, people just equate maths with science, but actually, in a way, it's much closer to magical thinking in certain ways. And I was very much aware of that uh, when I was at school. Um, you know, we, we were doing maths and higher maths. So we were sort of, you know, high up um, sixth form maths lot. And the teacher came in at the beginning of the lesson and wrote, let I be such that I squared equals minus one. Now, he had a revolution on his hand because we all knew that there's no such thing as the square root of a negative number. You know, we'd actually use that in proofs to show that if reductio absurdum, if you ended up with a square equal to a negative number, it couldn't possibly be true. So we had a sort of, you know, where is it? And he said, well, think of it as another dimension. Okay, where's that dimension or that sort of thing? Um, and eventually he sort of settled us down. He said, look, let's just, don't whether it's real or not, let's just see if it works. And so he did the algebra and it, it worked as algebra. Now, um, you see, he was scornful. We call the folklore department, which is physics where we weren't allowed, we didn't think we were allowed to look at anything if we didn't think it was real. But these numbers were called imaginary numbers and they worked perfectly well. Um, And the thing is, of course, that those imaginary numbers are really fundamental to all modern science. You know, electricity and things like that all depend on those imaginary numbers. So freed from that sort of thing that it must be real. um, I mean, I've drawn this analogy that, um, uh, I wrote a book about you know, how to see fairies, and I said that you know one way of gardening which works very well for people is you speak to the fairies. You know, um, where should I put this plant? Uh, now, of course, it's how the fairies going to answer. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't expect to hear an English voice coming back to you, <laughs> that sort of thing. But um, you walk around with the plant, and you suddenly get a feeling that this feels right. You know, and, and so. You know, you'll you'll say, I'm not sure whether fairies exist or not, but um, working with them seems to get interesting results. And so I saw an analogy there. And um, in that way, I found that uh, mathematics is in many ways closer to magical thinking, pure mathematics, that is. You know, applied mathematics is is much more scientific. mm. When I was researching you last night, uh, getting ready for the the interview, I came across one of your videos and you said something that really interested me. I think it was your your book, uh, S-S-O-T-B-M-E, and you were talking about an introduction of uh, magical thinking and the idea of, uh, you know, there's some authors who give you a magical text and they take you off into other worlds immediately, like you're talking about with, with imaginary numbers or something, for instance, mm. but this idea that there's magic here in this world around you and beginning mm. people from that perspective and seeing the magic in their everyday life, that, that just, that, that got me right in the heart. I love that a lot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just, just very much like Thomas, I, I love how much of a practical magician Thomas is. So both of your work has really indicated to me over the years here. And I, if you could elaborate on that a little bit about the idea yes. of, uh, magic in in this world where we don't need to necessarily conjure Enochian entities and the Goetia. Yes, I sort of worked on this for a lot over the years because um, one of the ways I put it was that um, uh, it's particularly true now. You'll find many books um, telling you how to start with magic, but not many books which tell you how to get to that start point. And in a way, I was doing that um, because many people come into it with the religious and scientific assumptions of our age and our uh, 
sort of environment. Um, and um, so they're constantly saying, well, is this real? You know, um, uh, or is this just something you imagine and things like that? And so what I tended to do was, as you say, I, I wasn't starting off by saying, you know, there are many planes of existence and there are um, spirits and things like that. I was more looking at uh, quirky things in our own lives and seeing them as clues that could open doors to magic. And um, a good example of that was uh, the book I wrote, uh, Little Book of Demons, where I begin with this thing that you know, when the office cop copier breaks down just when you're in a biggest hurry, how does it know you're in a biggest hurry? And um, I said that, argued that actually the business of talking to machines, um, if you ask people, why do you do that? Do you think it can hear you? They say, no, no, it's ridiculous. But it's a habit in us, which is actually quite a practical one. It gets results because if you just think of a thing in mechanical terms, you're only using a small part of your brain. I suppose you would say that's left brain. Whereas if you look at it in a bigger context, um, you see, for instance, for the photocopier, uh, why is it it breaks down just when it breaks pressure? Well, you either take it to bits and try to find a loose socket or something, or else you say, how do I behave to it when I'm in a mad hurry? And you realize that actually you behave differently. You may be slamming the lid down. You may be pressing the buttons too fast or things like that. And just sort of expanding to the idea that it might have a mind makes your whole interaction with it richer. And um, uh, you may probably end up by finding just a mechanical mistake, but I think you get there quicker. And I drew that comparison with um, uh, if you have if you're counseling you know, a problem child or something, and you could treat them like a laboratory specimen, you know, do them tests and things like that, wire them up and this, that, and the other, or you could speak to them as if they had a mind, as if they were human. And you might well end up with a mechanical explanation. Oh, he's a bully because his father bullied him. You know, okay, that's, that's like finding the loose plug. But I think you get there quicker because you're using... Um, all your sort of social and um, well, other brain functions rather than just the mechanical one. So, yeah, so that was an example of me, you know, looking at simple everyday things and saying, you know, there's something more there um, than you think. And it actually opens up. Because I went on to argue that, you know, um, one of the most fundamental things about magical thinking is the idea that you, a mind or a soul, if you like, can exist outside your own head. Once you start thinking like that, and in this case, you know, talking to the photocopy machine or talking to a person as though it too has got a mind, you know, it is, um, uh, you get a much more complex and rich experience. And um, uh, so, of course, that leads to, you know, does the dog have a mind and you treat it differently? What does a tree feel if I hug it, you know? Um, uh, what might a spring that's bubbling away, and there's a very complex um, interchange of information there and a spring bubbling away, might it be feeling something? There might there be a uh, sylph, or um, let me say, it would be sylph, no, what are they called? Yeah, I think it's sylph, these water spirits, or nymph, nymph, that's the word, yeah. Nyad? Or, might or... be a nymph in there, you see. And, um, uh, and I'd say that actually, even in such things as, uh, say, a market trader, now, an experienced market trader, they all look at the graphs and things like that, you know, and look at the trends and, and then look at the news and all these factors. But an experienced market trader might say, the markets are really nervous today. And although that sounds like a stupid thing to someone who doesn't believe the market's got a mind, it actually gives them a sort of understanding that can lead to better decisions. So, you know, it, it, this idea that um, there's mind out in the world is a very enriching idea and it opens up a lot more of the world. And um, you could do it for something like, you know, asking a question and looking for auguries in nature. Um, I'm gonna go and walk in the woods with this problem of, you know, 
uh, what's wrong with my love life or something. <laughs> and you, you just look, you know, look at the birds, look at the animals, look at the trees. And sometimes something just seems very significant pops up. And you couldn't explain to someone else, you know, why does this fallen tree with a leaf growing out of it, why is that significant? And then you think about it, and it might be something like, because there's a dead tree, but new life is growing out of it. Wow, that really clicks. And you tell it to someone else, and they say, well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? But it, it's the feeling of significance you have is really speaking to you, and that's, that's enriching. Absolutely. About, so, about 15 years ago on that subject, uh, myself and a lady used to walk every single day through the country lanes up here, up into the mountains and back. And we decided, just us by osmosis organically, to make a kind of an adventure of it. So we started to, to talk about these places as if, they, as if they were in Tolkien's Middle Earth. So one area we named oh, yeah. the Dryer, Shire, one area of the Brie, another part Valinor, and so on. And <laughs> mm. the most amazing thing started to happen. We started mm. to experience a fairy uh, experiences, the fairy stray, missing time, seeing lights above rivers, having things like simple things that's so significant, like one day the farmer was leading a bunch of cows down the road and he had with the cow a bull. And he said, step, step behind the gate because the bulls can be dangerous. And we got behind the gate. And this bull was like something from Middle Earth. It was like a creature like I'd never seen before. Then one day we're going around another field and there's a, there's a field full of peacocks. Out of the blue, the guy decides to start breeding peacocks. In a field <laughs> that was in uh, that that was in uh, Rivendell, the 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 uh, mm. the, 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 the elves, mm. the landscape actually became Middle Earth to some degree. Yes, despite yeah. our saying, "Oh, we'll go up here to Bree, we'll walk around by Rivendell, up by Valinor, and we would see things like lights above streams and everything." Mm. And this this is something I remember as a child. Even like coming home from school, I would turn the trip home from school into an adventure based on something I'd read in a book or a movie or something. And I mm. think this is an incredibly powerful form of magic that does mm. not get the, the gravitas it should get within the magical community. Mm. Yes, yes. Do you, did you watch the thing called Helia? I think it's called Helia. Um, yes. Now, um, that was a group of people who really were going out looking for magic. They were looking for these sort of links and strange things and all that. And I could describe it from a cynic's point of view. There's one episode I watched where the guy sort of went into a trance. You know, they were in this, in this building and, you know, sort of uh, they asked him questions and things. And he said a few things which were really sort of pretty trivial and all that. And then he said, um, I see a tin can. And, um, oh, right, yeah, he's seen a tin can. Then they go, a uh, short while later, into an old deserted mine tunnel. And, you know, it's a bit weird, and they kind of feel the atmosphere and things like that. And then he sees a tin can. Wow. Now, the cynic says, well... <laughs> Can you find any old mine shaft in the world that hasn't got a few old tin cans and bottles in there? You know, <laughs> yeah, what a load of rubbish. But I've missed one thing out of that that account, and it's a huge thing. It is that he saw it as very significant. Now, you see, it's a saying. Well, you know, it's, it's just subjective. That's a bit like you've got your flower beds all squashed and trampled, and you're looking closely at the broken flowers, but you're not noticing there's an elephant walking around the garden. You know, that feeling of significance for him was so huge. Um, and just to say, oh, well, that's subjective, that's nothing, is really missing the point because that sort of significance and meaningfulness, I think, exists. Yeah. And what the sort of skeptical materialist view does, it tells you what you're not allowed to see. So that, um, yeah. It tells you what you're not allowed to see. So once you start to crack it by doing a ritual or like you, you know, sort of looking at the world differently. And it can even happen with things like mindfulness. What, uh, in my How to See Fairies, I really sort of describe a form of mindfulness, being more aware, opening up your senses. Then you begin to see things which you're not supposed to see. And I gave an analogy of that in, in one of my talks. Um, I said, uh, 
let's say you've just been to the funeral of your grandfather and you're the first back at his house getting ready for the wake and you go into the um, dimly lit room and a corner of your eye you see him sitting in his old favorite chair now what you instinctively do is Miji switch on the light and stare hard and you realize it was just you know the shadow it wasn't him um, and I said this is like uh, you've got a sort of a filmmaker making reality in your head there's a script writer who put in that <laughs> there's grandpa sitting in a chair um, and there's a cameraman and there's a producer that says cut that out cut that out this is meant to be a serious movie you can't have crap like that in it you know none of this woo woo stuff and tells the um the cameraman to switch on the light and focus hard and sure enough he isn't there but i said what if you actually stopped uh, stop that automatic process and before, without switching on the light or without even staring at that corner just while you could see him in the corner of your eyes you said hi grandpa how are you? And then what if an answer came to your mind? Like, um, uh, you know, after the pain of the last six months, this is actually better than anything. You could actually not stop that sensor from saying, cut this out. And it's as though you now started making an art house movie. You're no longer making one that's going to put bums on seats and, and to be a blockbuster. You'll make it for a select audience. And that's the right thing to do, because you don't want to tell everyone, I saw grandpa there, they'll think you're crazy. But you might tell your grandmother, you know, do you guess what happened when I came in? There was grandpa. And he said, I asked how he was. And he said, much better now than the last six months, which was so painful. And she might find that very comforting. She might like your movie, that version of it. But I say it's, you know, what you're doing is just sort of... Um, telling that sensor to step aside for the moment um, and, and live out the experience more fully. And a lot of that sort of magic is like that. You know, if you'd had um, another person walking with you who said, oh, don't be stupid, you know, this is just a fantasy, isn't it? Um, it could have diffused it. It's like earthing um, static electricity. You know, it all goes, the, the power goes. But if you let it happen and then the critics will say, yeah, so really you're just telling people to be gullible, not to be critical. Now, what I argue is, no, you are critical, but after you've got results. You know, you may only half believe in a tarot pack, but you do a reading and you get some results. That's the time to look at it critically and say, now, which of these results are good and, which, and to actually tell me something, and which ones I just don't understand or, you know, I can leave them. And so, um, well, in the case of that, that check, a big sum of money, um, the right result is to say, well, actually, it's taught me something. Um, and in your case, the right result is you had a really interesting magical experience, you know, and you wouldn't try to convince... Um, uh, Richard Dawkins, that magic was real from that, because you, you have to put it to the right audience and other people will understand it and say, wow, that's amazing. You know, I was, I'd like to do that. So it's... About, about that big sum of money, big sum of money, mm. there's, a, there's a jester craft almost element of that, like a trickster kind of element. Yeah. You, mm. you know, is, is this, an, is this an, a third force? actually doing this for its own fun or is it your own nervous system playing with itself or do you have any theories on that well i don't know if you've seen a book i, I wrote called the good the bad the funny and basically what i argued in that is that we're very much locked into a sort of theology of god and devil and that locks us into us and them good and bad um into dualities and those dualities tend to split out into battles. And I thought, what if we thought in threes instead? Um, now, this isn't a totally original idea, because if you think of astrology, ask people what they know about astrology, and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, um, earth, air, fire, water. So they know about the fourfold aspects of it. And many of them know there are male and female signs you know aries taurus they alternate sort of masculine and feminine signs as you go around um 
not so many people will say, oh, yes, there's cardinal fixed and mutable. People don't think of that so much. But that is actually like ah, ooh, um. It's initiating, maintaining, and then closing down and getting ready for the next cycle or something. And um, that's like the three faces of the goddess. Now, you can describe a fourfold goddess scheme, um, mother, daughter, witch, Amazon. And that tends to typecast people. Oh, you know, she's an Amazon type. Just as earth, air, fire, water. Oh, he's a fire kind. Yeah, and she's an air fire sign, that sort of thing. Fourfold things tend to typecast people. Twofold thinking tends to create oppositions and tensions. Threefold thinking is different because mother, daughter, crone is not really about three types of women. It's about the evolving of one woman. The, the, the phases of the moon, um, growing to motherhood and then old age and then being ready for the rebirth. It's a, it's a moving cycling thing, just as cardinal fixed mutable is a moving thing, as is a-u-um. Uh, so I argue that threefold thinking has got us a flow to it. And so I, my question was, you know, if we had a, a theology of God, devil, trickster, um, might we think in this much more free-flowing way? Now, the thing is that people tend to say, oh, yes, that's a good idea. There's the two extremes, and then there's the sensible middle path. And I say, no, 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 no. That sensible middle just emphasizes that one line, that one dimension. But if you have the trickster as a third equal principle, like an equilateral triangle on its, on its back, um, then you get this sort of flowing living movement. And so I think that when people get locked into an us and them battle or, you know, um, Britain versus the world or, or whatever, that third principle hasn't gone. It's pulling the strings. It's like a puppet. It's playing the game because all those sort of dualities ultimately are usually um, uh, an illusion. Like, um, uh, yeah, Britain versus the world. Say I'm arguing for Brexit. Well, actually, my father, um, when I had my DNA tested, my father, as I knew, was a Saxon, because you know, his actually name was Saxon Snell. Um, uh, and he came from a Saxon background. But my mother had gone up to uh, her line, had gone up to Scandinavia and down to the Western Isles as a, a Viking. And so, okay. People think I'm very British, but you know, half of me came from Saxony and half of me was an invader from the north. You know, <laughs> So what right have I to call myself British? What right has anybody to call themselves British? This very clear distinction, when you look closely at it, it crumbles away. And um, so what do you end up defining? If you've got a British passport, what have I got a South African passport? Would I stop being British? The, so I think there's a trickster element there that's constantly uh, trapping us in, the, in those two dimensions. Whereas if we actually acknowledge the trickster as a third principle, I think there's real progress there for, again, sort of freeing up the, 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 the freeze, you know, um, getting things shifting again. Yeah, I think that the, the triple... The threefold thing is extremely important. It seems to there. It's definitely central to things like in the European mythology, where goddess oh, yeah. gods are represented. In Ireland is Era, Fulva, and Bamba. Same goddess, but three yes. expressions. You have the uh, the Morrigan, who's the Morrigana, the the Bathe, and the uh, the Morrigan, and that, that's like mm. the same thing. You see this over and over again. It may be even a proto-European thing because if you look at some of the very earliest Europe, European artwork prior Indo-European, you have triple spirals everywhere or three oh, dots yes, everywhere. Yes. So this, oh, yes, and the Isle of Man, the, the three-legged Isle of Man symbol. Yes, yeah, mm. the hard. Yeah. It's very much hardwired into where you have like the yin, yin and yang thing. Now, mm. I find that kind of interesting. There could be other ways of looking at that as well. But it seems to be mm. definitely from that kind of thinking from this part of the world. Mm. You know, yes. It was different. They're so challenging. And you have to have this element of this, things will go wrong because we don't have good weather and so on. And you need this mm. third element to rationalize the lack of mm. fixing too. Yeah. 
I often thought that was a very good way to live people's lives. I think also that's where things like the daemon or the genius and the Greek concept came from of the other, the other, the other part yeah. in. And mm. it seems to me that our education system is very much based on the re removal of this concept of beyond duality. You get a lot mm. of the new age thinking everything is dualistic. And that's mm. true to an extent. But I really do feel that that's like there's a catalyst that's the third. And it's, mm. it's, it's always forgotten. And yet I think that's the most important factor of all. Yes, yes. You see, all these, um, when I'm um, speaking for the threefold thinking, um, the slight tendency of people to think I'm trashing twofold and fourfold. I'm not. You know, um, if you think of alchemy, now the sort of man in the streets idea of alchemy, oh, that's turning lead into gold, isn't it? A duality, that is. Um, someone else will say, oh, yes, they believed in four elements, didn't they? Earth, air, fire, and water. But there's also sulfur, salt, and mercury. And they play this threefold um, thing. They are about a process. Um, you know, again, beginning, maintaining, and then getting ready for the change, the next thing. So I think this, this threefold thinking is very fundamental. And it's, um, it's one of the things that has been erased from uh, modern thinking. Um, you know, what do I mean? Sort of, you know, rationalism and that. Yeah. Uh, see, one of the daftest things I think that rationalism does is this idea, the same as when we were in that maths class and he put up something which we said, that's not true, it doesn't exist. The idea of truth as a binary, nothing more than a binary, Either something's true or it is false. It's either true or it's an illusion. Yeah. Actually, just truth, that's that one dimension, is actually a complete complex dimension. Because if you say, is a Shakespeare play true? If you just put that black and white thing on it, and of course it's not true. Um, how did he know Julius Caesar said that at that moment? You know, um, It's historically inaccurate. Um, there weren't clocks in those days, things like that. But on the other hand, from another angle, it's got enormous truth about human nature. You know, you could learn a lot about leadership and governance um, from studying a Shakespeare play. So there, it's both true and it's not true because truth is actually a complex thing with a lot of different um, aspects to it. Um, it isn't just a binary yes or no. And in fact, um, in going right back to Egypt and the Bhagavad Gita, people had three measures of excellence. It was the good, the beautiful, and the true. And they weren't like sort of three rival things. They were all enmeshed. You know, I think the Greeks would say things like, um, it can't be true if it isn't also beautiful, or it can't be beautiful if it hasn't got truth in it, things like that. They're sort of, they're really talking a three-dimensional world, which has not only been placed by a one-dimensional world, but really just a binary thing, true, false. That is such a, um, a degrading of experience, such a degrading of what can happen. Uh, and um, I think yeah, nuance, so. nuance is the enemy of the materialistic worldview. I mean, yeah. they, if you look at things since the, the Reformation and the natural philosophy gave way to like material science, you'd have something like, like look in cosmology, you have the moon and mm. the earth, right? They mm. study the orbital rotation of the moon around the earth. But they don't, within the same field, study the effects of the moon upon the tides, human emotions, mm. behavior, the flowering of yeah. plants, where that mm. would have been more, in the, in the natural philosophy world, that would have been incorporated. And yes, that's, yes, that yes. nuance, you know, it's like, here's the moon, here's the earth, let's talk about everything about it, except the actual mm. fundamental, important relationship it plays in the mm. actual processing of life on this mm. planet. And I find things like that, 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 that you, if you start adding out that nuanced thinking to mm. these materialistic concepts, they rapidly fall apart. Mm. Then this is why there's a, there yeah. has to be a stringent orthodoxy with it built with hardware within academia and so on. Mm. This is an example of, uh, giving of um, you know, where the materialist worldview tells you what not to look for. Um, imagine a, a typical sort of you know, um, double blind test on a thousand people to test a new drug. And if one of the research team says, hey, we've got all this data, let's look at people's moon signs to see if that's... Now, what they would say is, come off it. Um, we'll never get published in The Lancet if we put in woo-woo nonsense like that. Um, so 
here's something that would be dead easy to look at, you know, and they could use machine intelligence to quickly come to a conclusion, which might be negative. But um, the orthodoxy says you mustn't even look at that because it would not be accepted. Um, now, the interesting thing to me is you, you could talk about a sort of golden age of science, which was from the middle of Victorian times, when all the big discoveries like electricity, the foundations of what was um, you know, rad radium and radiation and um, uh, what was going to lead to uh, quantum theory and things like that. Those really big issues came up in the latter half of the 19th and early 20th century. Now, in those days, science would look at everything. You know, they looked at phrenology, they looked at eugenics, they looked at now, a lot of the things they came to negative conclusions, but they were prepared to research all sorts of things in life after death, you know, the Psychical Research Society and things like that. So um, that was a very rich time for science. And they, they were prepared to look at practically everything. But um, it's boiled down now, you know, <laughs> very limited set of things you're allowed to look at. Anything else you won't get published, you know. It's, um, Why do you think they put on the blinkers? Why do you think they did that? I have a friend here in Ireland who's a, a geneticist, and he's like, you know, he does not believe that quantum physics is real. He goes, load of nonsense, it's all made up. And yet mm. he's like a very well-educated, open-minded man otherwise. Mm. But, but I can see he actually applies blinkers to himself. Oh, yes. Where did come from? Yeah. Yes. Well, you see, the thing is, um, I've described this sort of, uh, rationalist um, materialist view it's really a dumbing down um, you know I compared it with the magical thinking where you put yeah. mind out into the world it's a dumbing down and they will justify it by saying well look what science has achieved well actually if you want to make achievements in this material world dumbing down is the way to do it politicians know that Trump didn't exactly give the most intellectual um, political theory <laughs> he said let's make america great you know brexit was was won by people saying let's get the power back um it's a dumbed down thing is very powerful in a dumbed down world and so um uh so it's a good reason to to be dumb and do all these things if you want to do certain things but if you want to rich live a richer life a more nuanced and textured life then don't be restricted by all that stuff, you know. Um, mm. There's actually there's an example like that um, where I've quoted, where a skeptic might say, if you're having women troubles, how ridiculous to light candles to the moon and burn incense, because that's a lump of rock out there. It's got absolutely no connection to your experience of womanhood. But of course, uh, our whole perception of the world is a virtual reality created by the brain, inside our brains. Um, you know, you could be hypnotized to think the moon was a, a dish or something, you know. Um, it, it's, your brain creates this movie, as I've given that example, creates a movie that it's supposed to see. Now, uh, the moon is just part of that movie. All your experience of the moon, you've never been there. It's all been modeled inside your brain. All your experience of womanhood is also modeled inside your brain. And are you really telling me that in that sort of few pounds of fatty material holds these very different things without there being any connection between them? That's crazy. <laughs> How could it all be in the same brain? Um, there must be some connections. Okay, the connections may be very tenuous. It might still be a little stupid to light candles to the moon, but you've got to explain why it is because um, it, it, it's all in that same model inside you. It's all built on your experience of life. They ignore the nervous system and the nervous system's relationship to mm. everything. I think that's a huge aspect of it. You're going mm. to say something, Jason? Oh, I was, I was going to say, yeah, absolutely, that uh, with the, the filmmaking thing, uh, there's something really interesting about deciding to make your life into more of a David Lynch film than, you know, yeah. trying to make it look like a documentary. But, you know, uh, uh, back to a few things ago we were talking about, I've been 
processing. I don't know if you guys ever have this experience where somebody, you know, like, like the two of you are, 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 are more advanced men than me in life where you hear people talking and it makes something click that you've been wondering about oh, yes. for a while. And er- early on when I was experimenting with magic, uh, uh, I, uh, going on, this is an anecdotal story similar to the one you talked about with, with making, um, a, a large sum of money. I, I was, you know, I was uh, this, this, I was first starting off with this and, and the whole idea of, I, I wanted to have a wild sexually feral experience. And I went into all these really descriptive details about it. And I was uh, sh- months after that, I was on the train and I'm sitting there just enjoying my train ride. And uh, there, everybody had been drinking and everything. And it was, I think it was late afternoon. I'm sitting there and, and this person behind me, this gentleman behind me starts crawling over the seat next to me and like, like an animal basically. And he, he'd been drinking a lot and I, I smelled the, the alcohol on him and he was like coming over the chair, like some kind of animal. And I, I had a bottle of wine on my table there. And it's like, he was, he was crawling oh over my. like a wild animal to this bottle of wine. And I, if you guys have ever been around epileptics, they do that screaming howl. And then they start having a seizure and this guy oh, yells yeah. right in my ear, like a, like a wolf or something and starts having a mm. terrible seizure mm. guy ended up to be okay. Ended up being okay. But I'm just, I'm processing that going, wait a minute, wild sexually <laughs> feral experience. That was absolutely <laughs> yes. you know, a werewolf experience. Yeah. And yeah. the guy was Crikey. kind of yeah. dry humping the, mm. uh, that's the part I, I left out. Mm. He was, he was making mm. these kind of sexual noises on the chair. Jeff, <laughs> as if it was a, <laughs> A woman yeah, or something, but <laughs> but I asked for that. It's like, oh, there's there's my wild Dionysian sexual experience, <laughs> wine and everything included. But but mm. there's that duality with sex too. There's the sexual mm. act and there's the reproductive act. And talking mm. about a wild sexual ex- feral experience, there it was. You know, with mm. you know, I, I didn't specify male or female. I didn't specify <laughs> reproductive <laughs> or pleasurable. <laughs> You know, now got something to think about for the rest of your life, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It's so interesting that you mentioned uh, Dionysius, because doesn't his doesn't his wild sexual forays happen in a car that's traveling and you were on a train? I didn't know that part, but it yeah. must. I mean, that, that was in there. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Him, him and his 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 fawning groupies would be in a, a carriage in one of the rich in one of the stories. There you were. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna write this yeah, down yeah. as soon as we get off the, yeah, the call yeah. here. I got my journal over there, and I'm however many years later. Things, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that trees about Dionysus is that very often, while this madness is all around, he's in the center, absolutely still. He's almost like the center of the cyclone, you know, and his very stillness seems to make everything go mad around him and everything. And I think that's, that's, that's a weird and interesting thing. Yeah, that was me. I was just sitting there. I'm like, okay, well, th- this is happening. Let's see where this goes and the seizure. I mean, I, I got up and helped the guy, you know, yeah. get on his side yeah. and everything. But yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's magic. And you know, it it mm. it it comes out exactly how you follow the recipe. And there's just that that trickster element in there. It's that's it's mm. sometimes entertaining, and you can go back and laugh at yourself about it. Mm. And but uh, <laughs> yeah, I love it. That's mm. uh, that you kind of you guys kind of helped me uh, resolve something that had been still. Mm up here and it's come down and, <laughs> oh, and right. locked away his experience so thank it's, you it's precipitating yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I've had very first magical incredible magical experience that i did and i didn't ask for it it happened and it was one of those things that made me understand that magic was real when i was about 14 i was under the bed covers reading the, a short collection of hp lovecraft's short stories while at the same time read listening to radio and tuning around the am dial f medium wave long wave remember long wave ramsey mm-hmm. and all long oh, wave. Yes. oh yeah yes. listening for stations and uh i was so absorbed in the the hp lovecraft stories i mean intensely this was like this mm. this literature that just blown my mind right as a child as a young as a young kid and at the same time tuning around this every because on the radio and mm-hmm. amazingly and this really happened an ad for a Buick dealer in Providence, Rhode Island, came into my earpiece. Oh. Now I didn't know fully. What, I didn't know what a Buick was, and I. But it, somehow that signal had traveled across the Atlantic. At mm. the moment, my nervous system was in a heightened state of concentration, and also the frustration mm-hmm. of trying to find a song while reading H.P. Lovecraft's Dogon. That mm. where H.P. Lovecraft was from. Providence is that's the center of every his whole life. Mm. What James Joyce was the Dublin mm. 
comes into my earpiece. And it was at that moment mm. I knew that I had done that. I had actually mm. changed, even though I had got the language of 14 to verbalize it, mm. but I knew I changed reality mm. at that point. Yeah. So, yes. you know, it happens like that. And the, you know, again, if one was to sort of extract the value of that, it was the feelings you had about it. You know, um, uh, there's no money coming out of it. There's no sort of, um, you know, something to persuade someone else. It's the feelings you had about it were powerful and memorable and affected you. And that's really, um, yeah, that's the actual value you get from it. Stack and uh, only I had that. It was like the universe had decided to give me a show. Mm. You know, yeah. there's a beautiful feeling in that. Well, I, I was, there's a thing in, in my childhood where um, I was shuffling a pack of cards and I thought of a number and a card, you know, like seven, the three of hearts. And I counted down seventh card. It was the three of hearts. Now, I repeated that several times, getting more and more excited. Wow. You know, um, uh, 15, four of spades. Good God, look, it's four of spades. I got so excited, I rushed to my brother and said, look what I could do. And I gave a number and a card, I counted down, it wasn't right. And that was a lesson to me of, um, you know, the magic is for you as an individual. Um, if you start trying to share it with other people, um, it probably won't work. You know, it, it, it's a message for you. Um, and uh, to try to sort of, um, yeah, share it with other people or try to gain prestige because of it in front of other people. Um, you can't rely on it anymore because it was a message to me. Let's go there because I'm very much in the belief that magic is like sex. It's, 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 a, it's an intimate process that belongs. It's, it's, it's not for public show or this kind mm. of thing. How do you feel about the concept of the solitary practitioner versus someone in a coven or a group? Hmm. Well, I did a recent set of talks um, about cults and I emphasize something there, which, which I think has got a lot of truth in it. Um, you know, the difference between a religion and magic. Now they have obviously got a lot in common because they both recognize spirit and, you know, and other factors, things like that. But to, I said that um, to me, what's different is the direction in two ways. One is that um, on the whole religion is about taking you from this world up to spirit, you know, getting you up to God. You, um, whereas magic is more about bringing spirit down into our everyday world. And I, I give the example, you know, um, uh, a statue of the Virgin Mary. Is that magic or is it religion? Well, it's magic because someone has carved this bit of stone and brought in the spirit of the Virgin Mary. So it's a piece of magic. But why did they do that? So that people could kneel in front of it and be lifted up to spirit. So the overall thing was religious, but it happened to be a magical act in a religious setting. Now, that, of course, was the very thing that worried the Protestants, the Puritans. Because they said, that's an idolatry. It's all very well saying that, but people will kneel in front of that thing and they're actually worshipping the statue rather than being taken up to God. And so that's the sort of thing they hate about magic. You know, um, they see it's actually the opposite of religion in that sense. Um, whereas in its own right, it's a very valid thing to do. You know, the new ager who washes his crystal and blesses it and makes it into a power object. He's bringing spirit down into it. And the other direction thing is... I think that um, it isn't really religion unless it unites people into a group, you know, a belief which has an in-group, a cult, if you like, to use a negative word, a cult around it, um, that's religious, whereas one person's ideas um, is magical. And I, I'd say if you were an anthropologist and you saw a whole tribe dressing up with deer horns and sort of dancing like a deer, you would say, oh, that's a religious festival because it's sort of, it's, it's binding the tribe to their totem animal or whatever. Whereas if um, one man or perhaps two go off in private and put on horns and dance like a deer, now that suggests it's a magical operation. They're probably doing that so they can hunt better or something like that. 
you know so i think very much um magic is on the side of individual experience and things like that and if you do have a group ritual which is a wonderful thing to do you know you get amazing experiences in a group ritual the real importance of it is what it does for each of the individuals in that um, the other part of it which is quite valid you know we're trying a group intention i say well really that's that's more of a religious um the way it's working out and it's not i'm not trying to be hard and fast on that but it's just like the direction is more religious if you're trying to do a group thing for a group purpose yeah you were saying there about cults i've known i I've known a couple of people who were in cults and they were absolutely happy. Genuinely, they were, you know, the, you know, before it went bad or ever went bad, they were mm-hmm. genuinely blissful and happy and very contented members of society. But what always struck me about them was that the, there was no them there. It was the je- the happiness that was brought about by the the mm-hmm. cult. And if anything happened to the cult, it was taken away or it oh, yes. happened like the leader died. The traumatic mm. effects on these people was absolutely atrocious. Yes, yes. That's very interesting because, you see, I gave four talks, and the first one was about the bliss of um, cults. And I gave an example of one which had been on Netflix, um, Buddha Field, where the pictures they showed you at the beginning of it, you thought, wow, I want a bit of that. You know, it was amazing. And in fact, one of the people said, these people were so alive. You know, I wanted to be part of it. Um, it was beautiful. Um, yeah. But... As you say, it sort of it went wrong. And um, so the question I was asking in that series is, how could you tell? You know, what's the danger point? And the sort of conclusion I came to is to put that very question. There you are really getting something out of the cult, a sense of purpose. Your life is now meaningful. You know, you're, you're relating to people in a better way than you ever did before, because usually people come into these cults from a low point in their lives. You know, life was dull, boring. Um, they were getting nowhere and they join it and they find everything they want. And so I said, I think the question to ask is what would happen if this was suddenly stopped? If cult busters my family got cult busters to come and kidnap me and take me back and decondition me now would i go back to my old boring life taking this richness with me i've discovered my joy i've discovered how to relate to people in a way i never could before can i take that back and enrich my dull old, old life or will i be utterly shattered that this is taken away from me and i won't be able to adjust and that I felt was really the sort of the fundamental question one should ask in a cult of what stage, and this is really the magical question, what stage am I gaining something from this that will make me actually a better person in any society? Uh, and what extent am I just an addict who's got hooked on something that I won't be able to give up? I'm frightened of giving it up. I'm frightened of leaving. I'm frightened. Of, yeah. Yeah, I so think that, that third force is the reason why cults break down. The teach to mm, people in them, no, it's your ass you have to be responsible for. Yes, yes. It's yeah, that's, that's true, isn't it? Because a cult, I, I drew the comparison with an egregore. And the thing about an egregore is it forms a solid edge by having enemies. You know, um, if you really want to get people in a, in a, a unified, you have a common enemy. You know, the, the ordinary life, the grey forces, or whatever. And um, uh, this individual thing tends to erode those sharp boundaries, and that's why you're very unpopular in a cult if you are too much of an individual. Start asking questions, you know, or um, whatever. Uh, you're damaging that skin. We see this on the macro level with the whole coronavirus thing. That virus has been transformed into some kind of demon or entity that many people are pathologically terrified of, as if it's actually stalking them all over the world. And at the same time, too, if someone says, well, you know, let's look at this objectively. We've survived bigger plagues in the past and so on without having all the strict thing. They're treated in the same way heretics were treated in the Middle Ages with absolute revulsion. And the religious hostility is very powerful. You see people wearing the mask, the social distancing, the washing. You have all these kind of like almost orthodox Catholic type rituals where it's Mm. given them back something that that, say secular society has taken from. And and it's a very very powerful process to stand Mm. outside and observe from neutrality. Yeah, that's very interesting, isn't it? Yes, you say it's giving them something um, 
I mean, I, I, I sometimes you know, when the world was looking very, very shaky, um, I was aware that what we really need is, is an enemy. We want an invasion from outer space that would unite humanity. Um, and I think that uh, this in a way is, it's interesting because it would be nice if it did totally unite humanity, whereas actually it's partly fragmented humanity. <laughs> this oppositions have given up, but it has got that potential. Um, looking back on it, we may say that was one of the biggest international cooperations, you know, the scientists working together for things like that. And having learned that, that might make it easier for people to actually do something about global warming and the damage to the environment because here's one example where so an international effort um, uh, worked. And so it's, you know, the, there's possibilities inherent in this, what some people see is a totally negative thing. Um, and to say that is not to say that it isn't negative. It's to say that, um, well, it's the alchemical thing, isn't it? You know, out of blackness can come gold. It's, uh, it's, partly what you do with it, what you're open, what you're going to allow to happen. And um, yeah. It's, well, it's, it's like the theme of this talk today. It's like, what will this do for you? What will this experience in this world today? What does it mm -hmm. teach you? What do you learn from it? Jason, mm -hmm. do you have any final questions for Ramsey before we wrap up? I was just going to add one more thing with the cult thing. It's so similar with, uh, again, processing things here for me in real time with, with the experience of joining the military. It's like you're halfway between oh, joining yeah. a tribe and joining a cult. And then yeah. on, on the way out, you've got service members who they, they will forever retain that identity of being Sergeant Roba, mm -hmm. or they will forever be uh, fighting against the, um, you know, there'll be forever a, a rebel without a cause kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there are the other types who they get out and they just try to find the next group. You know, they go become mm. born again Christians or they go, you know, yeah. they go join yeah. some uh, veterans organization. Mm. But it's it's like you, you do find the common enemy there. I was coming in during the recruiting surge, uh, you know, when when they were they were telling troops that, oh, you can't wear your uniform outside because somebody's going to kill you because they hate Americans and stuff. And there's mm. there are there are enemies within the U.S. and, you know, watch out for your neighbors and your family members that do this and that, mm. and, you know, uh, yeah. there is just that that thing where you take a bunch of kids right out of high school and college mm. Indoctrinate mm. them through, you know. I, I when I came across Thomas's work, I was in the military, and it's like, oh man, ritual, military ceremony. It's it's the same thing, you know. You go see oh, a change, yeah. of, changing of uh, a change of command or a uh, morning mm. colors ceremony, and it's like that's that's ritual magic right yeah. there. They might not know that that it's ritual magic, but that mm. the amount of um, like you're talking about bringing something down and 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 putting it within an object, whether it's the Eagle globe and anchor that a United States Marine gets, you get, you know, this little thing that goes on a hat that, oh, that you're yeah. given at the end of boot camp. But when, when mm -hmm. your drill instructor puts that in your hand, it's like, Holy shit. Gives me <laughs> chills. Just now thinking about it, you know, <laughs> but yeah. uh, it's, that's, that's a wonderful yeah. example because I, I actually referred to the, the military. I draw that comparison in the last video I did about cults. Um, you know, I said, I get to describe a cult that does all the worst things and I don't say it's you know, uh, isolating you from the family a lot of the time. You're behind barbed wire. And even like the sort of most crazed cults, you're being taught arms, arms, you know, to use arms. Um, right. And I said, actually, what I've described is a young man joining the army. And many people would be proud of that. But yeah. they say, oh, that's different because they understand the army. <laughs> and yeah, it's a, it's a very good example. Yeah. <laughs> I would just say to anyone, if you want to see how entrenched a cult thinking can become in military, go to Wielersburg Castle, the SS Temple in Germany, near Hanover, near Paderborn. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. music there is just, it's, these are religious objects that were worshipped. You know, they, mm. they had taken mm. something very primal within the Germanic consciousness surrounding, like lost paganism or neo, and a form of new, new neo-paganism oh, and weaponized yes, yeah. it within a military structure frighteningly so frightening yeah. and it's funny mm. stuff and jason spoke about the big things seeing an ss helmet wasn't frightening seeing a, a gun wasn't frightening what i found the most disturbing were those little insignias badges service medals there's oh, something yes. manic in a very dark way about mm. them and they, that they seem mm. to be the most 
the center of the military power. I don't know what that is, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Gosh, yes. I haven't been there, but it, it yeah, I would find that very interesting. And I would, um, I'd want to do the equivalent of crossing myself when I came out, I'm sure. <laughs> do a quick pentagram ritual or something. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. And, and for Americans, I'd say there's, there's so, cause so many Americans are in that category. Uh, Lionel, you were mm. talking about with, with the uh, material reductionist and everything. And it's like, as an American, if, if you want to go out and find magic, go to uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego or Paris Island, where the boot camp is where boot camp is, uh, where Marine Corps recruit training is, and watch uh, a boot camp graduation, watch the ceremony and see uh, that yes. that's American magic. It's if you want to call mm. it chaos magic, because it's, it's <laughs> using archetypes within uh, within uh, our mythology here in the US, which mm. is relatively mm. young compared to most of the world. Uh, mm. But th there, there's a tremendous amount of magical charge there. You can feel it in a Marine Corps ceremony. I've been in two mm. branches. I've been in the Army. I've been in the Marine Corps. It's, oh, it's, yes. it's there this much in the Army. But the mm. Marine Corps, you know, it's not a branch of the military. We joke around. It's a cult, you know. <laughs> you, oh, yes. that, that whole concept, yeah. once a Marine, always a Marine yeah. thing. Oh, yes, yes. So for anybody who's an American, and, and if you've, mm. uh, you haven't experienced magic for real, go on YouTube, mm. go to the depot. Oh, yeah watch a ceremony yeah. feel it in person you 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 feel it here mm. even mm. the the way that marines march the way yeah. the band sounds the uniforms it's it's ritual it's it's like probably like what going and seeing an old mm. original golden dawn uh <laughs> performance well, yeah yeah it probably that's that old cliche is used isn't it you can get a man out of the marines but you can't get the marines out of the man <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. jason one very quick interjection before we finish up at ramsey i'm sorry to hog this but you just unleashed a, a memory inside me the when i lived in new york the armory of the 69th in new york in manhattan has it's a, a temple it's an mm -hmm. edifice and it has mm -hmm. the name of the battles, Antietam, you know, mm -hmm. Guadalcanal. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's like this building has a, 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 an intense energy like you would not believe. And again, mm -hmm. the militarism, the, there's a whole subject there between militarism and occult that has mm -hmm. been explored, but needs a lot more work. But you just, wow, you just triggered that emotion when you said that. Mm -hmm. It just came up mm -hmm. in me. I can remember this, ooh, and it wasn't necessarily pleasant. It was almost like a bit frightening. Yeah. Yeah. But there mm -hmm. you go. Sorry, yeah. Ramsey. This was fantastic. You really <laughs> unleashed a lot of things about myself and Jason. Uh, I know you have a YouTube channel and you have your books out there. Do you have a website? We'll, we'll put it down the bottom during the whole program that people can go um, to. Yeah, there is a, a RamseyJukes.org, I think it is, or is it .co.uk. Um, I'm afraid I don't, I don't keep it up. Um, I think it lists my videos. And I've always intended, I've got to be taught again how to put in blog things because there are things I could put in, but I, so it's, um, it's, it's a bit static, but it does explain myself a bit, you know, that, um, okay. it's very static, I should say. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, oh would the YouTube Jukes. channel be better? Would the YouTube channel be better? Would, the, would that be better? Yes, YouTube? that's it. Cause that's, that's a live, you know, uh, um, I, I, I do things with that fairly often. Yeah. Mm. Well, Ramsey Duke, thank you very much for coming and sharing your wisdom and your life experience with us i'm sure the audience will get an awful lot out of this and uh you know the best of luck to you and your life down there in south africa and uh, if you ever want to come on again we'd love to have you back oh that would be lovely thank you i've been mean, really enjoyed having a three-way conversation yeah <laughs> there's the three again yeah. the triple again yeah three oh that's it yes there you go. yeah and uh, everybody else uh good night uh, thank you again jason and thank you ramsey jukes from the br313 symposium and we'll see you soon for another discussion thank you three one three <laughs> yeah <Yep. laughs> okay bye